PT boats, known as patrol torpedo boats, were widely used during World War II. These fast and maneuverable boats were made of cedar or mahogany, with the PT-103 class having a two-inch thick hull made of layered mahogany. PT-109, one of these boats was equipped with three Packard 12-cylinder engines, four torpedo tubes and machine gun mounts, making it a formidable vessel. PT boat duty was especially dangerous during World War II for a number of reasons. The boats faced challenges such as reduced speed due to marine growth on their hulls, torpedo launching system malfunctions leading to explosions, and torpedoes failing to detonate upon reaching their targets. To compensate for these issues, PT boat commanders added extra firepower and armor, but this additional weight hindered their speed, which was meant to be their main advantage against enemy ships. Nonetheless, the boats were designed to operate in small groups, relying on their agility to overcome the defensive armament of the enemy. PT-109, built in New Jersey in 1942 by Electric Launch Company, Elko, was delivered to the Navy in Norfolk and transported to the Pacific on a Liberty ship. Assigned to Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 2, PT-109 began its combat career in December 1942. LTJG John F. Kennedy, after completing his training and receiving orders to the Solomon Islands, arrived in April 1943, following a perilous voyage that included an attack by Japanese aircraft. When Kennedy took command of PT-109, the boat was in terrible condition. It had been in combat for months, barely seaworthy, with engines in need of repair and a fouled hull. The radar, radio, and torpedo tubes were all malfunctioning, and the crew had not served together before. Spare parts were scarce, so they had to scavenge from other boats and rely on Cumshaw to get the boat ready. Moving to the Russell Islands, the crew faced primitive living conditions, tropical diseases, and constant attacks from Japanese bombers. On August 1, 1943, PT-109 set out on its final mission, joining a group of 15 boats informed by codebreakers about Japanese naval activity. Led by Kennedy, PT-109 and its crew were tasked with preventing the Japanese from resupplying the garrison on New Georgia Island engaging the enemy destroyers in a surprise torpedo attack. As the Japanese Navy switched to using destroyers for resupply missions, American PT boats struggled to take them down. With unreliable torpedoes and late-arriving support from American destroyers, the PT boats were at a disadvantage. It was in this vulnerable state that John F. Kennedy's PT boat along with others, found themselves unknowingly in the path of an approaching Japanese destroyer. As Kennedy and his crew desperately tried to defend their boat, the onrushing destroyer collided with PT-109, slicing it in two. The impact ignited the fuel, causing a massive explosion and leaving the crew in a dire situation. With the boat sinking and engulfed in flames, Kennedy ordered his men to abandon ship, while nearby PT boats failed to search for survivors. In the darkness, Kennedy found his severely injured crew member, Patrick McMahon, and brought him to the front of the boat. He then searched for more crew members and found two others, escorting them back to the remains of the boat. By sunrise, 11 men were stranded on the sinking boat, drifting towards Japanese-held islands. Kennedy led his crew to swim towards a small, unoccupied island called Plum Pudding Island, towing McMahon with his injured back and using a timber to carry their belongings. After a four-hour journey, they reached the shore of Plum Pudding Island in the late afternoon. 
Plum Pudding Island provided no comfort for the stranded men. Kennedy led his crew to take cover behind the tree line, hidden from Japanese ships, while he swam to Ferguson Passage in search of help. Exhausted and with no sign of rescue, Kennedy made the decision to move the crew to Olasana Island, despite the challenging swim against a strong current. Although they found shelter and coconuts, the island lacked the crucial resource of fresh water. The crew of PT-109 was presumed lost after their boat was rammed in waters near Japanese-held islands. However, an Australian coast watcher named Arthur Reginald Evans decoded radio messages reporting the boat missing and sent natives to search for survivors, including two Melanesian natives named Byukugasa and Eroni Kumana. On August 5th, Kennedy and Ensign George Ross swam to Nauru Island, hoping to find an American PT boat on patrol. They stumbled upon a wrecked Japanese vessel and discovered supplies left behind by the Japanese. Kennedy later returned to Nauru Island and reunited with Ross, using a coconut husk to carve a message and a native canoe to search for an American boat in Ferguson Passage. Operating under the watchful eyes of the Japanese, the Coast Watcher Scout Service played a crucial role in locating Kennedy's crew. With the help of native scouts, Gasa, Kumana, and John Kari, they embarked on a perilous journey, battling rough waters and Japanese patrols, paddling for over 15 hours to reach an Allied outpost on Roviana Island, where they delivered the news of the crew's location. During the Battle of Vela Gulf in August 1943, American forces, led by Admiral William F. Halsey, intercepted and ambushed Japanese destroyers attempting to resupply their garrisons. Equipped with advanced radar, the Americans sank three out of four Japanese destroyers, marking the first independent action of American destroyers and the first time the Japanese were defeated in a nighttime destroyer battle. With this victory, the Americans demonstrated their ability to disrupt Japanese support and further endangered the Japanese garrison on Kolombangara. On August 7th, Gasa and Kumana, carrying the coconut with Kennedy's message, arrived at Rendova. Commander Warfield, skeptical of the natives, received them with disbelief, unsure if they were a Japanese trap. Meanwhile, Kennedy received the message from Evans, and a rescue operation was prepared, with PT-157 and PT-171 arriving after dark to extract Kennedy and take him to Olasana Island. Under the cover of darkness, Kennedy was rescued from the water and brought to Olasana Island where the crew of PT-109 was located. Navigating through treacherous reefs, the boats operated without lights to avoid detection by the Japanese. By dawn, they had safely returned to the base on Rendova, where the crew received medical attention and an investigation into the loss of the boat was launched. Kennedy chose to stay in the Solomon Islands instead of taking survival leave in the U.S. and was given command of PT-59. He oversaw the conversion of the boat, removing the torpedo tubes, adding more guns and armor, and installing a superior radar system. In September 1943, Kennedy spent five weeks refitting PT-59 at Tulagi, living on the boat throughout the conversion. The boat, along with two others, were then ordered to Lambu Lambu Cove on Vela La Vela, where they were assigned to support the next phase of the Solomon Islands campaign. With less than half a tank of gas, Kennedy pleaded for time to refuel before setting off on his mission, but was denied. Knowing he might have to abandon his boat under fire, he embarked with two officers as guides and picked up 10 wounded Marines along the way. 
As they made their way back to base, Kennedy's engines gave out, leaving him stranded. Thankfully, with the help of escorting boats and air cover, PT-59 and its crew arrived safely at Lambu Lambu, where they were able to refuel. The following day, Kennedy led another mission to Choiseul. PT-59 and four other boats returned to Voza that night to escort the slow landing craft evacuating the remaining Marines. They successfully countered Japanese fire and provided anti-aircraft protection, with the PTs exchanging fire with Japanese positions ashore. On November 5th, Kennedy used the guns of PT-59 to destroy three Japanese barges, and on November 11th, the boat drove off two more. Despite suffering from tropical ailments, Kennedy received high praise for his leadership and performance, but was ultimately relieved of command on November 18th due to his health. Kennedy's health suffered greatly during his time in combat, with his weight dropping and his back being injured. Despite his condition, he remained in the Navy until December 1944, commanding PT-59 before it was eventually sold and destroyed like most other PT boats. Throughout the war, the debate surrounding PT boats persisted. While they were not particularly effective against Japanese warships, they proved highly successful in targeting Japanese barges that supplied reinforcements and rescuing trapped troops. Additionally, their torpedo issues were resolved by 1944 and some boats were armed with rockets, making them comparable to American destroyers. However, the crew of PT boats faced significant risks, with approximately 100 boats lost during the war, including eight from being rammed by enemy vessels. In the 1960s, various accounts emerged regarding how PT-109 was lost. However, the Navy concluded that Lieutenant John F. Kennedy was not to blame for the loss and the deaths of two crew members. Despite conflicting opinions, none of the officers and crew present blamed Kennedy, as it was the motor machinist who opened the muffler flaps and throttles, responding to Kennedy's signal to throttle up. In a show of goodwill, Congressman Kennedy reached out to Kohei Hanami, the commander of the ship that sank PT-109, offering his best wishes and suggesting that their friendly exchange reflected positively on the relationship between their nations. Surprisingly, Hanami responded warmly, and the two former adversaries developed a friendship. Additionally, Kennedy appointed PT boat veterans to key positions in his administration, including Byron White, who investigated the incident and later became a Supreme Court justice. The coconut with Kennedy's survival message also found its way to the White House, serving as a unique paperweight on the president's desk. The Hollywood film PT-109, released in June 1963, took some creative liberties with the story. It portrayed Kennedy's boat as missing and initiated an immediate search, while in reality, Kennedy and his crew were presumed lost. The film also questioned how Kennedy allowed his boat to be rammed and depicted the PT boats in navy gray paint, although they were typically painted dark green. The story of PT-109 has been distorted since its loss, but Kennedy's role in the rescue was widely reported and recognized. Despite later criticism, his crew members remained loyal and spoke highly of his leadership, with the last surviving member keeping a picture of Kennedy in his bedroom, always referring to him as the skipper. <laughs>